I just wanted to give a quick introduction of what we're trying to accomplish here today. My name is Craig Johns. I'm the CEO of Germkill 365. We basically have two of the world leaders in two amazing industries and two professions. One, Dr. Marshall Ryder is a specialist in biofilms. He's a researcher and a scientist and a nurse. And also we have an expert from Power Plus Online, Kevin Wang, who's the world leader in disaster relief. Basically, we put these two people in a room, in a conference situation, and we recorded it for over two full days, and we captured six hours worth of video. And it was my job, and it was a tough one, to try to boil down those six hours of the little nuggets and the highlights that we could pull out of it um, to get ourselves about 35 minutes worth of content to share with the APIC conference this year. Today we're gathered uh, over here in Anaheim and just so, so excited. Uh, I've been looking forward to this in my little pea brain um, since the day I met Kevin. I've known uh, Marsha almost 25 years. I was thinking, man, if we could get these two powers together, it would be incredible. So um, here we are. Uh, Marsha flew in from Nashville yesterday. Uh, we had a brief discussion, um, talked about some cleaning things, talked about some biofilm things. I think it was awesome that both were able to share some things and help each other prepare for today because um, we've got an awesome day planned out and the concept is to do a brain share with one of the world leading scientists and researchers in biofilm um, who has a nursing background and then the world leading disaster relief um, econ and his company power plus online so biofilm and professional cleaning summit um, so we're going to talk about decontamination we're going to talk about how chemicals interact with biofilm and the biofilm formation. Um, the goals of today are for education for ourselves internally, but also at some point we would like to create some kind of a series out of this and help educate internal people and then hopefully at some point externally. Um, today is about enlightenment. Um, we're going to glorify God in all that we do. Um, as far as I'm concerned, God is sitting right there with us and uh, helping us along, but also keeping us on track and making sure that we do everything um, with high integrity and with uh, his intentions in mind. There are going to be some nuggets that come out today, some things that, that you're going to express out of Kevin and that Kevin's going to express out of you. And that's really what today is about. Today is not about a lecture. Um, uh, today is more about sharing some information coming up with new ideas together, and then how to apply science that's been around for a while and microbials that have been around for a while um, to this new COVID situation that we have going on now and forward. The superbugs and all these things are out there getting ready to fester um, probably after the COVID. Good. Any comments before we yeah. kind of get started? No, what I have to share today is, I think it fits rather perfectly. This was a presentation that was prepared uh, to deliver to a group of uh, infection preventionists uh, on surface uh, biofilms and disinfection challenges. 
So um, again, it will be directed you know, toward a clinician who is responsible for trying to maintain uh, disinfection within hospitals. Mm -hmm. But honestly, from, from the perspective, this is not just hospitals. Everything that we have to say applies everywhere. Wow. So I think right. it would be helpful. So when I say hospital, just assume that that means everywhere else too. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so for the audience, you know, a surface is a surface, whether it's found in right. a hospital or outside it. And so hospitals have two unique things that are a little bit different than the rest of the world. One is they're exposed to everything. So they get more junk, more biological loading, more viral activity. Um, so they have more of everything you don't want, and yet the demand for them to be cleaner than a home is greater. So talking about a hospital is a great thing because it's like putting a magnifying glass on the issues. So the things that need to be cleaned really need to be cleaned, and the things that are dirty really are dirty with the worst possible things. So, And as we'll see, all of the community-acquired infections actually, for the majority of them, originated in the hospital mm. and were brought out to the community. So that has expanded dramatically. And so, all, again, all of these principles apply. That is a concept that I have not heard but makes resonates in my spirit is probably absolute truth and yet is a bit horrifying so people think of the hospital as their savior not <laughs> not as uh, as the pollution point in their community that actually could make the community actually, control of nurses going into the consulting businesses and stepping outside of healthcare completely and they're stepping in as board members they're stepping in as committee members and they're stepping on as full-time employees at airports, at hotel chains, at resorts, um, golf resorts, um, schools. So we used to have a nurse that would work inside the school, but inside a district now, we're gonna have a lot more specialty. In addition to risk management, performance improvement, we're gonna have infection control um, and you know biofilm experts as well. So it's kind of interesting. You know, um, my head is just screaming with what you just said because you helped me put a piece of, of a puzzle together. And I know you're going to talk about it, but just for the audience's sake, um, the bomb that she just landed was, let me unpack some of that. Um, there's, uh, inside a hospital, they cannot get rid of viruses. They treat surfaces and they scrub and they clean and things like that. but. Viruses are so small, so pervasive, they get into nooks and crannies, corners, uh, obscure areas. And um, so it, it's basically almost impossible to get rid of a virus in a hospital or any, any form of bacteria. So they can knock it down even 99% with some great diligence, but they, to eliminate it's a whole other uh, issue. And there's tons of biological material, vomit, feces, blood, um, all the food that bacteria loves to eat. Um, and it's all human food. And the problem with feeding, let's say, a species, or for the audience's sake, an animal, human food, is you grow things that like to affect humans. So you culture, you entrain species that like to um, attack humans, like to eat humans. So things like flesh-eating bacteria, all that kind of stuff. Um, you're probably going to tell us how, where some of that stuff comes from. And, um, but you're going to be growing all that stuff in a hospital. And then in that, in that place, they can cross-pollinate, they can mutate, um, they can do all kinds of things. And the thing about, I've always taught about a hospital is, is I always call it a collector. So a hospital is like when somebody's sick, even they fly in from, say, another country, and they get sick, they go to a hospital. They get real sick. Well, now that hospital is infected with whatever that person has. So everybody's kind of really familiar with that now that we have coronavirus. Like, you kind of get it. People can get on a plane and infect an entire country. And we, in a matter of, you know, six months, or 20% of the population can be exposed to something. So um, hospitals can do the same thing. So when they fly into a hospital, they can contaminate it. So hospitals collect, um, they're like a zoo, 
for all of the nastiest of the nasty stuff for humans. It's, it's all of the stuff shows up there um, that is really bad for us. It's the stuff that made people so sick they had to go to the hospital. And so I realized that every single bacteria, every single virus that, that hospital has seen in its 30 some years of, of existence was, is present in that, in that sewer pipe. It gets all its food, it's got biofilms, it's got proteins to eat and drink, it, it's got everything it needs. To, to grow, to reproduce, to stay alive. And, um, and then I just thought, and then these little bugs are probably that about basically the heroes that work in those places that put themselves in harm's way. And, and you know, it's not necessarily all that dangerous for them because their bodies build up immunity to, to most of what they're around. But it's different when it gets out. And, and healthcare people. workers do, but not the patients. Yeah, and exactly. These patients, so, say it one more time. The healthcare workers may build an immunity yeah. to somewhat, yeah. but not the patients. Right. And the patients, um, a majority of them, or a very high percentage of them, are immunosuppressed. And so they're very vulnerable. Yeah. It's a dangerous place that really needs to completely be revamped on how it manages biological and viral agents. So we go back to the, you asked this question last evening when we were chatting about, oh, how long have these bacteria been around? You know, they've actually been around for 3.6 billion years for the first microorganisms on the earth. And so when we look at the natural history of what's happened, we see about 3 billion years ago were the first dinosaurs. Now we're talking about going from a one cell organism to <laughs> a, a, a huge, you know, a multi, uh, cellular uh, animal. But then, as we know, they disappeared about 200 million years ago. Now, that had to do with cataclysmic things and all of that. But even through all of that, the bacteria still live. And it's only been 140 million years that we had the first broad leaf trees. And we are the youngsters on this planet, only having been around about 100,000 years. So, during all of this time, Bacteria have survived and they have survived really well. And they are 3 billion years plus successful in surviving. So they have developed survival mechanisms, you know, to be able to survive all of these years when other cataclysmic events occurred. Basically saying is this, this is the uh, number of antimicrobial resistant deaths occurring in the world, that's 700,000. And that's represented by the balloon line? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you see compared to other deaths, you know, related to traffic accidents, etc. But if we don't control this problem by the year 2050, where we have 700,000 deaths now, we will have 10 million deaths per year uh, based upon antimicrobial resistance. Right. So if we there's one paragraph that I thought was pretty interesting in this report. The impact will be felt most acutely in healthcare settings. It's going to start in hospitals, exactly what we said, because that is where all of the nastiest bugs are and where there is the most evolutionary pressure for microbes to develop drug resistance, says the chemist Ian Seipel. Uh, at, he's at UCSF and the Cardiovascular Research Institute. All of the signs are there that this is going to be a really, really big problem. And so, another quote, if you had to pick whether the bugs or the drugs are winning, a lot of people would say it's the bugs. Wow. Yeah. And they're absolutely winning. There's not even a contest. But, correct. Yeah. So, you know, we're planktonic organisms just taken, you know, off of the surface. So how is this different from a biofilm? Well, first, in order for you to understand, this is a biofilm that you're looking at. And you can see that it's kind of a slimy, you know, jelly type substance on this medical device. <laughs> and, okay, I'm gonna ask questions. Okay. Okay, so this is, what is it, what am I looking That's at? That's latex. Right? Okay, and then this is, looks like Teflon? That's plastic. Okay, and these? That's, oh, those are just, um, dirt, you know, from the environment. Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, just. All right, but this gelatinous material gelatinous. that looks like 
bad jello. jello. Yeah, yeah so that's a biofilm. Got it. Okay, but you can't see any organisms, can you? No. I mean, how do I know this is a biofilm? <laughs> well, within that jelly, okay, are millions and millions and millions of bacteria. Okay, and this is a self-produced jelly that we're going to talk about in a few minutes. That they embed themselves. This is their survival mode, so that they can stay in there and be protected. Right, it's like a space capsule. So, and this is the device you were just looking at. Oh wow! <laughs> and that that biofilm picture on the stereo microscope was up here. Yeah, which which is something that you know you're going to always hear me talking about is nooks and crannies. So yeah. she's talking about it's growing in here. The reason it's growing in here is because it doesn't have the physical abrasion of a tooth. And it's a difficult to scrub out location. Yeah. And so whenever you Say have a magic word, yeah, scrubbing. <laughs> yeah. So whenever you have a feature like that, you're gonna have concentrations of the nastiest of nasty. So that's right. yeah. So that's what a biofilm looks like, and you can't see it yeah. unless it's an enormous amount. So it's microscopic. So how do they do this? Well, we start with the surface contact and whether it gets to a surface in a fluid, or whether you put it by touching, or whether it's airborne, such as the COVID virus. Somehow they get to a surface. For the COVID, it's in your nose, okay? They get to the inside line of your nose. So this is called the attachment phase, when the, when the uh, microorganism actually contacts that surface. As soon, and you see they're floating around where they arrive, but as soon as they touch that surface, millisecond, there's genetic changes within the cell wall. They understand they've touched something. So that allows them to generate a little bit of what we call polysaccharide adhesive, okay, uh, PSA. No. And it's, it's called differently for different organisms. But what it is, is glue. You're right. They produce a little sticky glue that allows them to stay stuck that surface. So they're not just in contact with it, they're glued to it. They're glued to like it. Like your dentures or your super glue. Some organisms, they have what's called irreversible attachment. So if they touch down and they don't like it, they can leave pseudomonas as one of those. So all of this that I'm telling you is in general, but for some specific organisms, they may do it a little bit different. Organisms around here, and I know it now because all yeah. these auto inducers are coming back into my cell. And when they go back into the cell, then you can see they're attaching to strands of DNA, okay? And when they do that, the DNA then sends messages to the RNA, which makes things uh, mm -hmm. within the cell. Mm -hmm. And so what are they going to make by these signals? Well, first of all, before we get there, this response results in the up and down regulation of over 800 genes and genetic changes within that cell. It's phenomenal, this is like. So this isn't just, hey, here I am. They have a full language that's, that's one third as robust as our language. Yeah, but there's other, and part of that machinery in the cell saying, okay, um, RNA, make me some protein. You know, make this. Okay, so what are they making? They're making uh, and embedding themselves in a self-produced matrix of extra po extracellular polymeric substance. That's a generic word that we use. Again, there's a million admixtures of this stuff depending on each organism. So it's composed of extracellular DNA, proteins, and polysaccharides. And this happens within hours and it continues to build um, within and forming a colony. At the same time they're doing this, we know that cells replicate, right? <laughs> so they're also, you know, for Staphylococcus, they replicate, they divide and become two cells within about 20 minutes. So they're secreting the substance and they're growing the colony. So the matrix holds the cells together in a mass and firmly attaches the colony to the surface. So now we're talking about the beginning of a, of a biofilm. That's right. Now okay. we're, so then that's, then becomes the growth phase. And then the continued growth of the microbial cells leads to a mature biofilm that contains millions of tightly packed cells. They are heterogeneous and they can be polymicrobial, which is a problem. By heterogeneous? Polymicrobial, meaning that, you know, it's not just necessarily one organism with, within that biofilm. Right, so you're talking about a village that communicates. Correct. So an entire, entire city 
yes. <laughs> like hanging out down there. They got 800 words plus 800. Bear in mind, that's what we know about, right? Yeah, so there could and be about 20 percent of medical device infections are polymicrobial. So if you give an antibiotic that can kill uh, Staphylococcus aureus, that antibiotic may not work on some other organism that's in the biofilm. So you kill all the staph, but you're left with the biofilm of Enterococcus. Right. <laughs> and they'll survive very well and take over. So, that, sure. so in environmental engineering, like doing soil decon and remediation in, in like say mangroves and delicate structures like that, in, in one cubic centimeter of soil, of healthy soil, you can have 20 million different species of bacteria. <laughs> Twenty antibiotics will never work for that because right. antibiotic is targeted yeah, you know, for one thing in the cell to right. kill it. Right. And so that would never work. Yeah. That's why I like ozone and UV a lot. So because I can disassemble things, I like oxidizers. Um, I do a lot of that work and we'll talk about that later. So now these cells are very different. The ones that were floating around and landed you know, on your surface, but now they are going to be completely changed. Again, we talked about the genetic gearing up or down, and they're different. And now they're called, instead of planktonic, they're called sessile organisms. This happens to be a step for this page. Yeah, and you brought back to this. <laughs> but it's so just a we, laboratory we, method to be able to sort it, separate the proteins. Yeah, yeah, it's used for like DNA stuff. Yeah, and, right. And that's what we use yeah. it for. Mm -hmm. And and you, you can, a form of it's used well, not a form, but it's also used for DNA analysis of identifying okay. people. Right? Yeah. So you can you can identify things with it really well. So in this chart on the left, I'm looking at a pseudomonas and, and well, that's a staph aureus. I just put there is a picture of a bio. Oh, I'm not up here. Oh the, yeah, here in this yeah. one. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, those are the same pseudomonas out of the beaker. Okay. We took the pseudomonas out of the beaker and made them grow a biofilm. Right. So, well, this is out of the beaker. This is once it grew a biofilm. Right? Correct. Mm -hmm. so, so this is how it, uh, e each of these little lines is, is an indicator. It's almost like code in a computer. So, mm -hmm. so this image is dropped in on top of what they're really reading. Right. So these little lines and thick lines, so the locations of the lines and the thickness of the lines is the thumbprint to bark with. It, it's, yeah, it's yeah, a beautiful exactly. way of saying it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it. And they would put an antagonistic species in the, in the presence of the bacteria on the root films of a corn plant on one side of this. Within an hour, the response was triggered a mile away in the bacteria of, of um, out of the films on the on the roots okay. of the plants. Yes. Oh, okay. okay. So, so we I just was... talked about the biofilm resistance, you know, <laughs> the, uh, protecting themselves from outside um, their vulnerabilities. But okay. and we said they're resistant because they're in a biofilm. Okay. They're in a cooperative community mm -hmm. that's able to protect itself. But there's also the other part of the antimicrobial resistance. If you have even one um, bacteria that has a resistant gene in it, and in a biofilm, they're all kind of together. They want to play. <laughs> so they will extend a sexual pili and hook up with their friend, and then they will transfer that uh, resistant gene to the other one. Can it do it across species? Yes. Oh, that's scary. Yeah. Okay. And then the fourth category is those we're interested in, the dry surface biofilms, like bed rails, countertops, IV pole curtains, needleless connectors, anything. Anything. Biofilms because they can attach to other microbes. Yeah. And so we think they are surviving in biofilms, but ta -da. Right. But all its machinery. And um, so the can viruses replicate, because viruses replicate themselves through the cell. So when cells replicate, you now have extra, which means viruses must be able to replicate and live in bacteria. Correct. So, correct. and biofilm protects the bacteria. So I wanna just string this all together as a, as a thing. So 
a lot of people are feeling like, okay, a virus lands on the surface and it's going to die in a few hours. But if there's enough biofilms or the right species of bacteria present, those viruses can replicate in that environment and maybe survive much longer, correct? We think so. That um, kind of in summary, to put this all together, uh, biofilm cells are very different. That's why in our science, we have to understand how they're different and how we can kill those. Uh, and they're profoundly different in that they are resistant to all our host defenses. Our white blood cells can't get them. They rapidly increase antimicrobial resistance within the biofilm because of their sh sharing of plasmids. They're resistant to antibiotics, antiseptics, and disinfectants. They release large numbers of cells because they're, when the cell uh, biofilm gets large enough and they can't sustain them all, then they release cells to go start biofilms elsewhere. They are strongly adherent to the surface and they can survive for very long periods of time. And this is what the right. biofilm so looks like. So we created two samples. And so here you go. Right. So again, the clean, right. the stainless steel, and the one that was dirty, the put right. organic soil. And this is showing you um, and a red is dead, right. green is alive. Right. So it shows how much. Uh, this means a lot. Right. It does. So <laughs> it's harder to kill them in right. a soil. Right. So let's talk about a cleaning pie. So this has been around in the professional cleaning market for a long time. It's called a cleaning pie. And I'm going to pick on the chart of chemicals. to the ultra green people, but yes, water's a chemical, so not all chemicals are bad. And then, um, and then you're gonna let it dwell. So you have to allow for a period of time for dwelling. And, and what that does is soften things up, like um, because when they're softer, they can come out, they can be removed easier. And the closer you can get them to a vapor state, the better. So if you can get them to, from a solid to a liquid, you've, you've done wonders. And then, Heat is important for a lot of reasons, but there's some exceptions, and we'll talk about those because um, they help soften things up. Um, and then pressure and agitation is critical for, for getting surfaces clean. And this last one is extraction and rinse. So if you do these first four well, then you get what I like to call mud soup, which, by the way, I'm going to keep all of this training really simple. So kind of complex stuff kept as simple as I can because I have 30 years. Because it's so revel, revelant, yeah, revelant, relevant, 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 relevant. So I'm going to, I'm going to just pick on something. I don't know, at this point, uh, it's probably close to methane. So I just built you a little hard hydrocarbon chain there. It's close to methane. So hydrogens and carbons, they bond through their electrovalences. And it's going back to high school chemistry there. So <clears throat> I keep going. Um, funny thing about chemistry, one of the things I love about it, it's like Lego pieces. If I, if I, this has one type of characteristic, and if I add a carbon to it, it's completely different. It's not, it's no longer like the hydrogen, and the carbon's no, like, no longer like the carbon. It's like completely different. And the wacky thing about chemistry is if I just add one more of each, you'd think I got twice as much of this. You don't. You got something completely different. And if you add one more, you don't get three of it. You get something completely different. They'll tend to have some common characteristics, but they're totally different. So that might be like natural gas. That might be like um, methane. Another might be propane. Another one is acetylene. Another one is benzene. So when I get to six of them, I'm at benzene, which is a building block of life, and, and it's um, in just about every pharmaceutical in some format. So, um, and we are made out of hydrocarbon chains. So here's, here's what happens. You have to remember that while we'll have some similarities, if I change anything here, it's completely different. So I can do different things. You play mad scientist. You can use oxidizers. So you get something that comes in that's like oxygen, um, and it'll go, hey, I like you, hydrogen, come with me. And it has a stronger charge. 
and it'll pull it off of here. Now I've just done what's called an oxidation reduction reaction. And now I have a hydrogen and two oxygens, which is H2O, which is our air. Which by the way, this might have, this this before is a gas that's explosive. And if I breathe it in concentration, I will die. So I just added a little oxygen, I turned it into what I like to breathe. And then I can take another one down here and I go, hey guys. Let's come along and have a party and they'll yeah. pull off the carbon. Now I have a C and two O's yeah. to CO2, which is my bubbles in my drink and what I exhale. So I just reduced this. So this is what happens with all peroxides to viruses and bacteria and things like that, is it deconstructs the molecules at the nuclear level. It's why it's so powerful, it's why it's so effective, it's why tiny amounts and large amounts of fluid work so well. It's why you can have 150 parts per million. If you think about it, a million parts of water, you only need 150 parts of chlorine is a strong, is a strong solution. Um, so that's oxidation reduction, and so that's what oxidizers do. So this can be done with an ozone generator, so you're dealing with gases only, no fluids. You can go into environments and use it for fire damage, dead body cleanup, severe odor problems. So you can, you can do oxidation reduction this way. The byproducts of glass ice is extraction and rinse. So you wanna extract that. Now, I will say that if you extract uh, only, if you have a surface and I come in and I've made my wet, my wet soup right up to here, because this surface is not flat, it actually looks more like, you know, my asperities. Looks more like this, and it, and it's full of water, fluid all the way down here, right? What's going to happen when I extract my mud soup? Bear in mind, I drew it with a blue pen, but it's not clean. If I come along and I extract, and I get 90% extraction. I'm still left with all this. And it's not clean water, it's dirty water, and it's not, and it still contains bacteria and everything else. So, so extraction only doesn't really work. What it really has to happen is more like when you take a shower, when you're rinsing off. So as you're rinsing off, you're taking clean fluid that replaces this dirty fluid and ejects it. Okay. So clean fluid replaces this dirty fluid, and that's how you get high-level cleaning. So if you extract off the 95%, it's great, you got 95%, but if you're dealing with the, anything that really, you really need clean, like to make a safe environment from, against viruses or radiological stuff, you need to have a, a way of, of extracting it. Well, if you just flood, you're not breaking the surface tension of the water either. So, but if you think about the cleaning capture tools that they drew, yeah. they're pressure washing and they're, they're doing the, the scrubbing, mm -hmm. they're breaking surface tension, and they're extracting, mm -hmm. and they're rinsing with pressurized clean fluid 10,000 times a second. Mm -hmm. So when they pass over an area, there's no residue of anything, there's just water. There's not even a slime layer. Even a wipe leaves a slime layer. Right, of course. They don't get any dwell. They don't get any dwell because moppers that mop floors, 99% of them, if you have not been trained in this, you will not do this. So unless you've been trained properly, you will you will switch your mop back and forth and you walk your way out of an environment. There's no dwell. You have to go back. If you want to do this, you have to go back. But moppers don't go back. They're like, don't walk on that. I just mopped yeah. it. Yeah. Don't walk on it. So what you really need to do to get good mop results is intentionally leave your footprints, go back into the furthest point, and re-mop your way back out. But mopping is such a bad technology anyway, it doesn't yeah. even matter. Because right. you're already spreading mud soup. But here's the thing, like. So now, a couple caveats. Do you want to go back and people are like, what about? So, and you guys have been really good. You haven't picked on me for any of these. There's a few things you got to remember. Remember the chemical, you got to not use a chemical that eats the substrate. So um, on dwell time, not all dwell times, ideal dwell times is 10 minutes. It can be seconds with some things, it can be days with others. 
Um, on heat, this is a big one. Um, you can damage certain substrates by getting too hot. And then there's one caveat with heat. There's one family of contamination that doesn't like hot water, and that's proteins. So I always train. Yeah. So, you so I train. I train them. Here's how I train cleaners. I say, guys, think about an egg. If I break an egg and spill it on my carpet, it's a liquid. It's the closest thing to a gas, and it's easy to extract that liquid. To do it with cold water. This is make scrambled egg butter. But if you heat that egg up, you will <laughs> cook that onto all your fibers. Wow. It will become a solid, and all these asperities and it will not come out. And that's true for all proteins. Yes, now we're gonna talk about proteins in a second. So, so blood. Yes, no, but hang on. So, so, so you want to clean proteins with cold water first, okay. then go back and clean with hot. Why? Because it's not the only thing. So if I'm doing a crime scene cleanup or dead body cleanup or whatever, so crime scene, always a lot of blood, um, cold water first. And the type of chemistry I pick is, is an enzyme-based protein-removing chemical. So I use a protein steam remover to break down the proteins in the blood. And use cold water and, and then clean. And I may do that two or three times to get all the blood out. And then I, when I've done my best effort there, then I'll use um, hot water to get everything else out. So to clean the environment. So because you can have oils and films that are protecting more blood underneath it or more other proteins. So, so you gotta do that. So heat, when you have proteins, that's one of the things you wanna be careful of. Use cold water first, then go back and do a second pass with pot. Hey everybody, it's Craig Johns with Germ Kill 365. So blessed and so honored to be here today to tell you about a new product that we're launching. The new product is called Can of Wipes. But we'll just let that sit for a second. We're going to tell you why we come up with a product like this. This is a demand-based innovation. The demand is there's back orders on all these products. This one here um, is the one you used to be able to get at the grocery stores. You used to be able to get at the pharmacies. Can't get them into an empty shelf. So they're just frustrating everyone. This is the one that doctors, nurses, dentists, they're all in dire need of this product and they are on back order as well. They only have as much as they used to get before the COVID. Now they're doing five or six times as much cleaning. It's causing a huge back order situation. Now, back to our product. What we innovated was a product that has dry wipes in it. So you actually pull the wipe out. Once you, once you use your high level disinfectant inside there, now you're saturating and making your own wipes to replace these systems. The disinfectants that you put in here, if you're gonna put one in, make sure it's EPA approved. We have three products, one called hypochlorous acid, one called CP64, and another one called citricide. All three of these products are EPA approved. You pour it in here, you let it saturate for 15 or 20 minutes. Once it's saturated, all you have to do is pull your wipe out and you start your cleaning process. The CDC guidelines are recommending that you clean first, which means you have to disrupt the biofilm and then take a second wipe and do your high level disinfecting. Anyone has any questions on how to purchase these products or how to use these products or any other information, you can just go to our website right here. We also have a sales rep that could contact you immediately. You can reach out to your sales rep or just call right now and the operator will help get you connected with a sales rep and someone that can get you the information and the products needed. Thank you again so much. God bless. and I were talking over the weekend. We were watching people clean. I was watching a lady clean the bathroom and she was doing this. And then, and this. And off to a new area. It was an absolute joke. I mean, she wasn't cleaning anything at all. And um, so uh, we were talking about how what real cleaning would look like. And before I talk about that, uh, another common one, you might be at a restaurant and see somebody take a square bottle and we'll kind of go like that and we'll go like, that's about as good as you'll ever see it get and they're off to another table. When you do that, there's a lot of problems. One is all the dirt and grime at that table, you just took it from that table and just smeared it to every other table. It doesn't even matter if I'm using disinfectants. 
So I'm taking what was on that table, putting it on this towel, and now I'm gonna smear it to every other surface. Craig and I like to call it drenched. And that's a better towel to work with, especially with disinfectants. So when you use that, what you're gonna do is, it's not a, some people will go like that. Now that's good coverage, I got 100% coverage, but I didn't get any real scrubbing. And so if I wanna remove biomaterial, I have to push down hard and, and do some scrubbing motion. So it would look more like this with overlap, so about 50%. And you don't ever see so many cleaning tables in a restaurant like that. It takes just a few seconds longer, but look at the difference in the dirt I got. So now I got all this black stuff off of that table. It wasn't there in the first two times I did this. And, um, and what that is, is I've removed some biofilm that would be there for the next customer if this wasn't done properly. So now if I take this towel, and I go and I start wiping over here, this biofilm that you can see, I'm now spreading it. So there's a concept in decon that you use, and I'll show you how to do it. You can, if you get something like a can of wipes, you get a lot of wipes in the, in the unit. And um, uh, what you can do is I'm just doing this with a pen, so you can see it, but um, I'm creating quadrants. So you can kind of see how, how it might work. I think most of you already kind of understand where I'm going with this is um, I can take this towel and quadrant it out. So this is quadrant one and I would do my scrubbing with it, you know, and ideally on an average surface like this, I would definitely do no more than one table. And you see even, I, even still, you see, I get some more um, dirt and biofilm material off of something I just previously cleaned. So I could take that, and if I really want to use it, I would use two for the next table. And then I could flip this and use three for the next table, and four for the table after that. And if I really, whenever you're treating a bar, or school, or classroom. So, you know, if this were a classroom, you would want to do this with, you'd only want to do eight, eight students' desks with that. So no more where people are running around with this, they'll clean an entire school. It's just, it's ridiculous. If, if you really understand biofilms and, and proper decontamination, that's a joke. It's, it's such bad practice, it's not even funny. So it won't, have, it won't stand up in a court of law. Um, it's, it's too easy to pierce because it's just a really bad way of doing it. So um, doing proper scrubbing, and with towels and quadrant, you know, quadranting them uh, is hands down the best practice. So, hope that helps. ...that address all decontamination issues. But what are the technologies that provide solutions to all of the listed problems? Prodigy Bio, developed in Anaheim, California, in a series of Prodigy machines, has proven itself as a powerful and reliable decontamination and cleaning machine and is the heart of the comprehensive package. With an engine which provides up to 4,000 pounds of pressure per square inch, or PSI, and equally powerful suction, the Prodigy Bio can handle up to 1,000 feet of hose. This means that the Prodigy Bio can have several workers decontaminating from one machine and still have the power to decontaminate surfaces that are in different positions. Surfaces that are upside down, vertical, or even underwater are able to be decontaminated and cleaned using the Prodigy Bio. The Prodigy Bio provides the perfect backbone for the clean and capture tools. Clean and capture is the process by which high pressure agitation and immediate extraction occurs within a closed tool head. This creates superior cleaning results with no runoff, overspray, or cross-contamination. What does this mean to Japan? This means the worker can wash and dry as he decontaminates any given surface, all the while injecting a special chemical that attracts radioactive particles to itself. It then gathers all the ions together and is then collected by the suction at the tool's head at the rate of up to 10,000 rinses per second.
firmly at Power Plus firmly established uh, the best methodologies of seeking out and destroying the enemy, but now we know the best bullets to use. So we've been using um, some some chemistry that that works well. But one of the great things that you brought to the table, Marcia, was was a clear understanding of the exact chemistry that breaks these biofilms down. And by being able to utilize that with our equipment, uh, we're going to be able to have immediate uh, um, orders of magnitude in, in the increase in the amount of decontamination that we can achieve. Well, we've always used the concept, you know, in uh, cleaning of medical devices and, and uh, surfaces, the concept of cleaning and disinfecting. Because remember, we talked about biofilms being strongly adherent to surfaces. So you can apply all the chemical you want, but the, they're, they're going to still be there. They may be dead and the slime might be somewhat diminished, but there are still cells in that biofilm that can recover because they are uh, down-regulated, but yet when they are uh, exposed to oxygen and more nutrients, they will come right back. Right. So just the application of chemicals doesn't do the job completely. And to your point, in terms of extraction, that, that's the uh, important component there. We're cleaning the surface, removing the organic material and soil, and then um, applying the chemical and also the mechanical friction and extraction of all of the material. Right. So that's Kevin, yeah, that's Kevin, talk a bit about, Kevin, talk a little bit about the uh, clean and capture, if you wouldn't mind. So clean and capture is, is, the, is a quantum leap above using sponges, towels, or mops to clean a surface. It, it is defined as high pressure uh, agitation within the confines of a tool head so that there's no overspray or splatter with immediate extraction. And so you're basically pressure washing inside a vacuum chamber that you put on a surface. And then that vacuum chamber, you're pressure washing, creating tremendous agitation and rinsing at about 10,000 times per second per square inch. And that's what achieves high level decontamination and removal of solids and semi-solids and solutes in solution once you've applied you know, your ideal chemistry. And it's, uh, it's pivotal. It's the only way to produce high-level decontamination. So towels won't do it. Mops won't do it. No amount of scrubbing will do it. Clean and capture is the only technology known to man that, that can achieve high-level decontamination. So Kevin, in the meantime, um, what can people do today and tomorrow if they don't have this um, technology? Marsha talked about the three steps, clean and make sure that you remove and then you disinfect. If they were to use wipes, for example, would you recommend reusable cloth, rags, or would you use disposables? And, um, you know, do you, is it a two-step? What's the best way to do it? Well, obviously, you want to aim for your best possible practices, but for economic reasons or, or a plethora of other reasons, you may have to use, you know, the next most suitable and available technology. That would be wipes and a quadrant off your wipes and not clean more than about maybe four square feet of any surface, of a surface that appears clean. You have to scrub the surface with a towel. It means, it means downward pressure, and scrubbing, and orbital motions work best uh, for, for getting into the nooks and crannies of, of asperities. Arsha, what type of studies would you suggest if we were gonna test the protocols, the new equipment, and obviously some one or two different chemicals that you may come up with? Do you have any, do you have any thoughts on um, how we would start documenting and getting some data? Well, we need to begin with the in vitro testing 
in terms of growing biofilms on um, various um, surface materials, uh, and then applying the various uh, uh, disinfectants or applying it with different types of uh, application uh, for different time periods. It's a very complicated uh, process because, as Kevin mentioned, you know, you have to kind of study one variable at a time. So it's a, um, uh, a difficult process uh, for studying and developing these protocols, but we certainly do have the ability to do that. Excellent. And, and what I mentioned just to, is in a situation while, like we're in, we're operating outside of full and perfect knowledge. So you can't, you can't be stagnant and do nothing. So what you do is, you apply the best known procedures in science that we do know. And what we do know is that technologies like clean and capture is a best practice. Um, a lesser a step down from that is using something like industrial wipes, uh, like can of wipes, and uh, using those with uh, an appropriate disinfectant. So those are two fantastic mm. tools that we know work well. You could use both of those with just water and get better results than doing nothing. So the chemistry um, is an additive, you know, it increases the percentage of efficacy greatly. And um, so what we know right now is what chemicals to begin using that help break down those biofilms more rapidly than the professional cleaning products that our industry has been using for 10, 20 years. So we have you know, hundreds of medical grade disinfectants and cleaning agents in our in our war room and the showroom. Um, but we now recognize from what she's taught us is that those things are have been like throwing a dart in the right direction of the dartboard. But now we know what the little red bullseye is. So we're going to be immediately working on bringing to market those chemicals. Outstanding. Thank you so much. There's actually three, three components in terms of the testing. It, first of all, you could have two groups. One would be a, just a surface biofilm. The, the second would be a biofilm within organic soiling on that surface, because those are two different um, uh, approaches to biofilm eradication. Most importantly is your organic uh, soil surface because that's what we see mostly in our environment, especially in a hospital. So when you do that testing, there's three things you want to know. One is, did you eradicate the biofilm? Well, uh, yes or no. And if there is any biofilm remaining, do those cells come back? Do they remain and rebuild a biofilm? And then the other aspect is, are the bacteria from those recovered biofilms transmissible to a patient or to another surface? So the, the testing uh, and from what we've learned over the past decade, and what, this is only really the beginning uh, of understanding about dry surface biofilms, uh, but these are the important uh, components in terms of infection prevention. And, and let me tell you what we already know from our side, just from working in the field for 30 years on this. So sometimes, you know, field work pre precedes scientific documentation and understanding. And, and in this case, it's definitely the case. I guarantee you that, like we already know that if you kill what's in a biofilm, then that biofilm is a perfect home for reinfestation. And, and that's true from everything from rats to bacteria to whatever. And, and we also know that um, all of those films are going to be retransmittable if you're talking about can they be spread or wiped from one surface to another. A surface. But the question would be, was it a hundred percent because if it's not a hundred percent they will recover and they will come back and they will reform the biofilm 
And then the question is, if I come along and touch that surface with that newly formed biofilm, can I actually uh, um, take, uh, by the touch, touching the surface, will those be on my hand that I will go and uh, have touch contamination elsewhere and transfer those bacteria from that surface to a patient? And, and I know that the lab tests maybe aren't there, but I'll tell you right now, I'm 100% positive the answer is yes. And this is, well, yes, this is what we're learning because we haven't sophisticated our technology yet. And this is what you are doing. And this is what we are trying to do to develop the technology that will uh, prevent against uh, reformation of the biofilm and transmissibility. Well done. Excellent. I mean, the time that you spent and, and the effort to come out to California and uh, Kevin to host us at your place and, and take good care of us and the spirited conversations were amazing. Thank you so much. It's a great start. We believe there's lots of work that needs to be done. There'll be follow-up educational seminars as well. I just want to say thank you both and God bless. Same, Craig. <laughs> Thank you.